everyone. In part two of this series on the Liturgy of the Eucharist, we continue with the Eucharistic prayer. This prayer is the centre and summit of the entire celebration of Mass. It is proclaimed by the priest in the name of Christ and on behalf of the entire assembly which professes its faith and gives its assent through dialogue and acclamations culminating in the great Amen. On more solemn occasions the entire Eucharistic prayer may be sung. Eucharist means praise and thanksgiving which is especially highlighted in the preface. Even though we use the word preface for this part of the Mass, it's not to be seen as a preliminary to the Eucharistic prayer, but part of it. The Missal contains a number of Eucharistic prayers. Along with the four we're familiar with, there are two on reconciliation added in 1975, sometimes used during the Lenten season and on other occasions. There are also Eucharistic prayers for special needs and occasions. Before Vatican II, that means the Second Vatican Council, which ended in December 1965, there was only one Eucharistic prayer, better known as the Roman Canon, which is retained in the present Missal. Eucharistic Prayer II, the shortest, and Eucharistic Prayer IV, the longest, date their origins back to the 4th century. Eucharistic Prayer III was newly composed following Vatican II. The Eucharistic prayer is said by the priest alone and all the people should listen to it attentively with reverence and silence. The chief elements making up this prayer are as follows. Thanksgiving. This is especially brought out in the preface. The priest in the name of the people glorifies God the Father and gives thanks for the whole work of creation or some special aspect of it that corresponds to the feast day of the liturgical season in hand. Now in the revised translation the dialogue preceding the preface is set to music so the priest is strongly encouraged to sing it at least on Sundays. The acclamation Uniting their voices with the heavenly hosts of angels in a universal outburst of praise, the priests and congregations sing the Sanctus, or Holy Holy, the first line of which is based on a passage from the book of Isaiah 6.3. In the revised text, there is slight change in the first line of this acclamation. God of power and might is replaced by Lord God of hosts. Hosts, in the Latin translation, is Sabaoth. Actually, it is a Hebrew word fused with the Latin. It refers to God's command over the armies of angels. It proclaims the power of God who has all the forces of heaven and earth under his control. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is a direct quote from Psalm 118, 26. The Holy Holy is a musical priority and if possible should always be sung. The words of the text should correspond with those in the Roman Missal and not be altered. Epiclesis meaning invocation upon. The priest, by stretching his hands, palms down over the offerings in the name of the church, implores the Holy Spirit to come down on the bread and wine so that they become Christ's body and blood at the consecration. This change is referred to as transubstantiation. Next. The Institution, Narrative and Consecration In words and actions, the sacrifice which Christ instituted at the Last Supper is celebrated. Under the appearance of bread and wine, he offered his body and blood for us on the cross. 
gave them to the apostles to eat and drink, and commanded that they carry on this mystery in his memory. Memorial in the scriptures is not merely recording a past event, but in a certain sense making it present again sacramentally. At Mass, Christ does not suffer or die again. Rather, he prolongs, represents, and renews his great moment of sacrifice down through the centuries. It's like Calvary being suspended in time for the benefit of men and women of every generation until he returns in glory. The words of consecration have but two changes in the revised missal. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body. It means that we all share of the same bread which highlights our oneness as the body of Christ brought out in 1 Corinthians 10.17. Furthermore, inserting the word for shows that the body and blood we share is the same offer to the Father on our behalf. In the revised institution narrative, the covenant is called eternal instead of everlasting. Everlasting means something like long-lasting and is within the confines of time. However, eternal is beyond any possible measurement of time. Also replacing shed are the words poured out. These new words suggest the passion was not something which just happened to Jesus, but something he freely chose to undergo. The word all is replaced by many. Did Jesus not die for all? Many is the opposite of few, but it's not a point between none and all. For instance, if you invite a hundred people to a party and all a hundred show up, you have many and all. The universal nature of Christ's salvation is not lacking in other Bible passages. John 11.54, 2 Corinthians 5.14-16, Titus 2.11 and 1 John 2.2. 2. Jesus used the word many at the Last Supper, which is a literal translation of the Latin. Remember, we're Catholics, not Calvinists. In the next text, word cup is replaced by chalice, which is biblically based. At the risk of diminishing the doctrine of the real presence in the eyes of the faithful, the Church asks us to refrain from using common vessels at Mass, which are lacking in quality, or seen as mere containers. Also proscribed are vessels made from glass, earthenware, clay, or other materials that break easily. Sacramentum Redemptoris Sacramentum 2004 After the consecration, there is, as usual, the proclamation of faith. Now, just like we say the gospel of the Lord, so also at this point in the revised text, we simply say the mystery of faith. If anything, the liturgical renewal enshrined in the revised missal is aiming to refocus our attention back to the prime purpose of Mass, which is adoration and praise of God, as well as supplication and obtaining pardon for our sins. In my humble view, after Vatican II, the celebration of Mass tended to downplay the divine element and lean more towards the human. We lost an awful lot of people in the process. Mass is not a performance, still less pageantry. Neither is it a service which suggests non-participation by the assembly. The involvement which is called for is a real engagement of mind and heart where the faithful in the spirit of humility, through word, action and silent reflection, are drawn to offer praise and thanks to God in spirit and in truth. 
full, active and conscious participation called for in Vatican II means much more than running round in circles chasing our tails. The current words, let us proclaim the mystery of faith, also means that the priest joins the people in making the application which is not what he is meant to do. Instead, the priest makes the announcement and the congregation responds with the acclamation. Now we continue with what is known as the anamnesis or memory. Fulfilling the command of Christ given to the apostles at the Last Supper and passed on to us, the Church treasures the memory of the saving work of Christ in his passion, death and resurrection. The offering is next. In it, the Church here and now assembled offers Christ, the victim, to the Father in the Holy Spirit. The faithful also offer themselves so as to be drawn into ever more perfect union through Christ with God the Father and with each other so that God may be all in all. The intercessions point out that the Eucharist is a celebration of the whole church in heaven, on earth and in purgatory so that the offering is made for all its members both living and dead. In this context, I notice in Catholic circles these days that funeral masses are seen more as celebrations of the life of the person than praying for the happy repose of the deceased person's soul. It may be fine for other denominations who by and large don't believe in praying for the dead, but for Catholics it's different. On the cover of the order of service, it's no harm to remind people that the Mass is primarily said for the happy repose of the person's soul. We still believe in purgatory. It is firmly attested to in Scripture and part of the constant teaching of the Church from the beginning. To enhance the above, I believe that purple vestments are best worn at adult funerals. But in the case of children, white vestments seem more appropriate. Long-winded eulogies are also out of place at funeral masses. That doesn't mean that we don't mention anything about the person. But saying over-the-top things like, We're burying a veritable saint today are completely inappropriate. That is God's domain and we should leave it to him. Also, it is best to refrain from bringing up a raft of objects at the presentation of gifts associated with the person's life at funeral masses. I remember once at a funeral in Ireland when the family brought up the dead person's pipe and they placed it on the coffin. Now things like this trivialise the liturgy and should never be allowed. Another thing which puzzles me is when ministers set about explaining the symbolism of an action such as incensing the coffin or sprinkling with, with holy water. By doing this, they actually take the power out of the symbol. It's like someone, before they shake hands with you, saying, I'm going to shake hands with you now because I am happy to see you, which of course sounds silly. People don't need ex explanations at funeral masses or any masses for that matter the fewer words we say the better in some instances the liturgy of the word degenerates into a liturgy of words it's best to let liturgy speak for itself of course some like listening to the sound of their own voice now we come to the final doxology just like the Eucharistic prayer opens with a dialogue, so also it closes with one. The praise of God is expressed in the doxology which is sung by the priest, then affirmed and concluded by the people's song response in the great Amen. Since it consists of only two syllables, it may be best to repeat it a number of times when sung. Once, 
when asked to explain the meaning of the word Amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, a child thought for a moment and then compared it to email. It's like hitting the send button. We send our entire message all at once through the angelic web server to the inbox of the one who rules over all. Thank you all very much for listening and God bless you all.